Hello, my name is Stephen Cobb, and this is a narration of an article titled The Malware Factor. Subtitle, The Covid Effect Means We Can No Longer Ignore the Malware Factor. I published this on May 8th, 2020. At a time when the vulnerability of human biology is so painfully evident, it might seem recklessly morbid to point out that the infrastructure of our current reality is also deeply vulnerable. But I believe this has to be done, and now is the time to do it. Why? The following five points outline my reasoning, to which I will speak in more detail in the rest of the article, portions of which first appeared on Scob's blog. Point 1. The COVID-19 pandemic is exploiting, at scale, vulnerabilities inherent in human biology. Humans have known for some time that something like this could happen, and experts have warned for decades that we were not doing enough to a. reduce the probability that it would happen, and b. prepared to respond appropriately when or if it did happen. Point 2. The exploitation for selfish ends of vulnerabilities inherent in the digital infrastructure of our current reality has increased in scale, scope and impact with the emergence and consolidation of that reality. Experts have warned for decades that we weren't doing enough to deter or constrain that exploitation. Point three. Humans have also known for some time that the impact of this phenomenon, herein referred to as the malware factor, increases during times of crisis. The growth of malware-enabled, pandemic-themed misuse and abuse of information and communications technology, the COVID effect, has been as phenomenal as it was predictable. Point four. Failure to heed the advice of experts has led to the malware factor magnifying the impact of COVID-19, while undermining efforts to contain it. Point five. Failure to act decisively on what we can learn from this will be deeply damaging to current and future generations of humans. The Malware Factor I believe it is time for the world to face this fact. The misuse and abuse of information and communications technology, ICT, threatens to undermine all present and future human endeavour, from self-driving cars to mobile apps for population health management, from raising children to reigning in pandemics. I find it helpful to think of the misuse and abuse of ICT as the malware factor, mainly because it is enabled by and embodied in malicious software or malware. To be clear, malware is computer code, and daily life for most people today is heavily reliant on computers and the code they run, from the massive networks of machines that enable banking and payment processing to the smartphones in our pockets and purses. All computers run on code, and the only computer that can't run malware is one that is turned off. Malware is as much a part of the ICT with which we have constructed our current reality as pathogens are a part of our biological existence. To put it crudely, malware is to cyberspace as pathogens are to meat space. That said, the conscious creation and use of malware to achieve ends that are at odds with those whose computers it runs on, the malware factor, is a distinctly human phenomenon, one that has quite predictable in the light of human history. In the late 1970s, criminologists and other social scientists studying increases in malicious meat space activity, for example, property crime, found that it flourishes in sync with the deployment of technology. In their classic paper, social change and crime rate trends, a routine activity approach, Cohen and Felsen put it like this. The opportunity for predatory crime appears to be enmeshed in the opportunity structure for legitimate activities, to such an extent that it might be very difficult to root out substantial amounts of crime without modifying much of our way of life. As I noted in my 2015 talk at TEDx San Diego, the phrase opportunity structure for legitimate activities sounds very much like a description of the internet. In the five years since then, I have come to see that the opportunity, 
for predatory crime as well as legitimate activity now resides several layers further down the technology stack in the code that makes ICT work. The routine activity theory developed by Cohen and Felsen, based on empirical methods, influenced many of the crime reduction programs in the last quarter of the 20th century. In the 2020s, the world needs more research and more insight into how malware undermines the structure and potential benefits of legitimate code. The COVID effect. It was the father of empiricism, the English philosopher Francis Bacon, who said in one of his less empirical moments, Prosperity doth best discover vice, but adversity doth best discover virtue. That was in the essay of adversity. Clearly, this was said before the invention of email and its subsequent perversion by morally challenged humans bent on leveraging adversity at scale. As any experienced information security professional will tell you, when people are stressed by the struggle to cope with a crisis, a global pandemic for example, they are more likely to click links that lead to scams. Of course, COVID-19 has led to many examples of virtue, but it has also sparked a global surge in digitally enabled vice, aka cybercrime, aka crime. And here's a parenthetical comment. As I have said elsewhere, in a post-digital world, the term cybercrime is of limited utility. While we cannot say, yet, that all crime is cybercrime, just about all crime has cyber elements. Fortunately, some of the fine folks working to keep at bay the surge in digitally enabled COVID-19 vice have been documenting the situation. By March 12, 2020, Alex Garahu, a research analyst at Digital Shadows, had catalogued a sickening array of technology abuse. He wrote it up in a lengthy blog post titled How Cybercriminals Are Taking Advantage of COVID-19, Scams, Fraud and Misinformation. Alex opens with an observation that has been true since at least September of 2001. In the wake of large-scale global events, cybercriminals are among the first to attempt to sow discord, spread disinformation and seek financial gain. He goes on to explain the implications of this 21st century reality. While COVID-19 itself presents a significant global security risk to individuals and organisations across the world, cybercriminal activity around this global pandemic can result in financial damage and promote dangerous guidance, ultimately putting additional strains on efforts to contain the virus. While I might have said immediately instead of ultimately that Alex accurately framed the problem, a problem we might usually refer to as the COVID effect. This is the amplification of harms arising from a crisis together with the undermining of crisis response efforts. I fear this COVID effect is far more serious than most people yet realise, with implications for current and future efforts to deal with crises and catastrophes that very few policy makers have been willing to face. The current reality is that large-scale global events, as well as many regional and even personal human endeavours, are negatively impacted by unwanted human activity that is enabled at a fundamental level by malicious use and abuse of code. This is true of events or endeavours that take place in meat space or cyberspace or both. The physical distribution of medicine and equipment to contain a pandemic could be disrupted, for example a ransomware attack on a shipping company, as could the strategy of having people use computers and the internet to work from home to contain a pandemic, for example credential stealing attacks on home networks. Before summarising the implications of the malware factor in this current reality, let me address why I think it is helpful to refer to this reality as post-digital. The easiest way to do this, for me anyway, is to quote Professor Gary Hall, Director of the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University. The digital can no longer be understood as a separate domain of culture. Today, digital information processing is present in every aspect of our lives. This includes our global communication, 
entertainment, education, energy, banking, health, transport, manufacturing, food and water supply systems. Attention therefore needs to turn from the digital understood as a separate sphere and towards the various overlapping processes and infrastructures that shape and organize the digital and that the digital helps to shape and organize in turn. End of quote. There is no need for me to restate what Hall says there. I agree that we need to acknowledge that the digital is now part of our lives and life on Earth, whether we like it or not. And to be clear, while going off the grid can minimise your interaction with the digital, the digital is still a part of your world. Just check the night sky for passing satellites if you don't believe me. The way forward. It is time for the governments of the world and their policymakers, as well as citizens, to give serious consideration to the implications of these three assertions. 1. The misuse and abuse of information and communications technology, ICT, threatens to undermine all present and future human endeavours, from raising children to reigning in pandemics. This phenomenon, herein referred to as the malware factor, is enabled by and embodied in malicious software or malware, and is inherent in the infrastructure of our post-digital world. And, point three, the use of malware by criminals and governments during the COVID-19 pandemic is prima facie evidence that our post-digital reality is based on code, abuse of which is impossible to prevent. I'm now working on prioritising a list of implications that follow from those assertions. But here are two for immediate consideration. A. Threat reduction requires urgent attention. We are not working hard enough or fast enough to reduce the number of humans willing to abuse other people's ICT for their own ends. Point B. Our hopes for solving humanity's problems with code-based technology, like artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, or space exploration, need to be questioned, given that abusive code is proving impossible to prevent. For anyone who doubts the statement, abuse of code is proving impossible to prevent, an article on this will be posted shortly. So, I'm not wedded to the malware factor as the name for the phenomenon of the misuse and abuse of information and communications technology. But I will be publishing more on this, exploring the nexus of biology, medicine, viruses, infrastructure, platform capitalism, existential risk, and maybe even Genesis, the religious text, not the band. Some people will find it hard to believe that this malware factor cannot be negated with one or more of three strategies. Spend more money on cybersecurity products and services. Improve the efficacy of those products and services. Increase the security awareness of people who use, make, manage digital technology. Basically most people on the planet. Having spent more than three decades working with and for people pursuing those three strategies, advocating for each of them at one time or another, it is my opinion that, while they have merit, they lack the ability to solve the fundamental problem, which is the willingness of humans to use technology for malicious ends. Before computers and computer networks, that willingness to abuse technology was easier to identify, outlaw, isolate and deter. Now we find ourselves dependent upon a technology that can be manipulated remotely, at scale, with high levels of autonomy and anonymity, using low-cost tools that require no brawn or scarce materials to acquire or operate. In my opinion, we have yet to fully comprehend the implications of digital technology as it relates to human behaviour. For example, think about theft. For the better part of 200,000 years, theft meant physically taking something from somebody and thereby depriving them of it. Things that were stolen were often referred to as gone missing. Now a thief can steal your company's data or your personal music collection without depriving you of it, possibly without you even noticing it's missing, because 
in a very important sense, it isn't missing. Here are two very different, but arguably equally important, implications of the infinite and almost instantaneous lossless duplication and distribution of digital artifacts. 1. When you download an unauthorized digital copy of a movie, it may not feel as bad as stealing something physical. I think this has impeded the development of digital ethics in ways that we have yet to fully understand. 2. When you deploy a digital weapon, for example Stuxnet, you are gifting it to your enemy. This is not yet fully understood by governments, governments who develop such code. This is a topic that I discussed in a paper presented at the 2014 NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence conference known as SICON. In the coming months I hope to discuss more implications and post more steps forward. In the meantime, a good introduction to the differentness of digital crime can be had from this widely cited 2004 paper by Brenner. Anyone looking to explore the parallels between biological pathogens and malware may well find this BBC video helpful. It's called Secret Universe, The Hidden Life of the Cell. I do warn it contains scenes of simulated violence between a virus and a human cell, and it may be geofenced, so I've provided some alternative sources for the video. Hashtag malware factor, hashtag infosec, Hashtag COVID-19, hashtag COVID-effect. Here ends the narration.